May the words that I speak this morning be in the name of our God and our tradition, the life giver, pain bearer, love maker. I don't know how much time you spend thinking about John the Baptist. Um, I often or have thought in the part that he's a bit of a, a marginal figure, a bit of a, a crazy guy in weird clothes who comes on stage simply to introduce us to Jesus, who, if we believe the details of the tradition, was purported to be his cousin. But John the Baptizer is actually the headline act, both this week, the second Sunday of Advent, and next week, the third Sunday of Advent. And that must mean that he's very, very important in this lead up to Christmas. In fact, he must be twice as important as Mary, because she only gets one Sunday, the fourth Sunday in Advent. And so this morning, I want to explore a bit what John represents and how we need to engage with John if we're to get to Christmas. Because without encountering the Baptist, I don't think we can get a full understanding of Jesus and his mission. Now, if you showed a picture of the face of a man with a beard, a gaunt face with a beard and a stovepipe hat to Americans, who would they immediately recognize? Abraham Lincoln. All Americans would immediately know who that was. Similarly, if you share the description we get in Mark's Gospel of John as a man clothed in camel's hair <clears throat> with a leather belt around his waist eating locusts and wild honey, if you showed that picture to a first century Palestinian Jew, they would immediately have recognized, anyone know? Yeah. Sorry? Elijah. Everyone would have known that that's who John was, his, his dressing up symbolized the figure of Elijah from the Jewish tradition, a key figure. And that evocative conjuring up of an Old Testament prophet is critical to understanding John and thus understanding Jesus because it tells us something about the political dimension of the figure of Elijah and his disciples. Elijah, what Elijah did in the Jewish tradition was to pronounce judgment on the king and the court for faithlessly violating the covenant relationship with God. He publicly accused those in power of violating their relationship with God. Elijah also communicated God's redemptive action in protecting his people against invasion, domination and oppression. And one of the last prophets in the Jewish tradition before Jesus was Malachi. And so the words that would have been ringing in the heads of the followers of John and of Jesus was Malachi's words, Behold, I will send Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. So this is all the background and the cultural and religious tradition that is built into this figure of John when he appears in our Gospels. And he comes in the guise of Elijah, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins and predicting the coming of a stronger one who would do even more. And that preaching of John, I don't know if we, in the few words we get about him in the Gospels, it's very difficult for us to, to realise the impact that it would have had. Because the preaching of John 
was incendiary in first century Palestine. And it's what got him killed. Because the baptism that he spoke of, and which he performed, was a direct indictment of the ruling authorities of his day, namely the temple and the huge cult around the temple, which everyone was called or supposed to be caught up in. So by his preaching, John is calling out, naming the corrupt behaviour of the religious authorities. He's naming them as having failed the people. And then more than that, what he does by his actions is to sidestep the religious monopoly that the temple had. And so instead of the purification and washing rites that people had to perform at the temple, John takes them away from the temple precincts and practices, practices a far more fundamental form of baptism in the river, in the Jordan, completely outside the religious machine. And what he's doing really is reminding his followers that they need to see their religious tradition through a different lens. He reminds them they need to pay attention, that something new and different is required in their situation, and that they've got to think outside the box. And that's what his actions are all about. And the sin that John talks about is not predominantly individual sin, although that's important, but his central understanding of the sin that needs repentance and forgiveness is based on his religious tradition of a people in covenant relationship with God. So it's something much bigger than individual sin. What John is talking about is the sin that takes up residence in systems of oppression. Sin that is propagated by public lies. There are quite a few of those around at the moment in our public life. Sin that thrives on injustice. Sin as an attitude that refuses to see the human face in those different to us. Sin that rationalises self-serving ways and keeps the status quo in power. Sin that builds walls between people and which ruptures the relational web of life. And we know this sort of sin because it is all around us. If you've been reading some of the newspaper reports the last few weeks, you can see that we see it in the ways in which dark money is attacking the roots of democracy by the hidden funding of extremism by big corporations in order to destabilise our politi political order. We see it in the abject failure of governments, and by extension ourselves, to put the world's biggest threat of all, climate change, at the top of the political agenda. We see it in the ugly rhetoric from government, the press and social media, which denigrates people who are different from a white male norm and attempts to build walls between people rather than bridges to align them. And we see it in the rampant consumerism in which we are all so easily caught up, which fails to recognise that for everyone to have what they need, those of us in the rich world need to radically reduce rather than increase our consumption of absolutely everything. John sets that agenda for us and the tradition that we're part of suggests that 
Jesus comes out of John just as much as Jesus comes out of Mary. He also tells us that the one who is coming with a gentle, radical rule is the only one who can guide us on this path. And who will encourage us, because this is one of our big dangers, to bring together our political critique with the challenges to our personal behaviour. Us liberals are very, very good at blaming everybody else for what's going on in the world. But Jesus brings together the personal and the political. He brings together John and Mary for a faith that is holistic. So, in the 67th year of the reign of Elizabeth, when Theresa was ruler of Britannia, and Donald was Lord of the Stars and Stripes, during the priesthood, the high priesthood of Justin and Francis, the word of God comes to us. And it comes whenever and wherever repentance and forgiveness are needed. It will come this Christmas if we heed John's words. And it has never been more needed than in this 21st century. Amen.